And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And welcome to the show this morning. Of course, second best day of the week as we get into Thursday's edition of The Real Investment Show. Today, of course, CPI Day. Da, da, da. I mean, we need, we need like a music soundtrack. <laughs> but this is, of course, you know, our month to month drift. You know, we go from one CPI report to the next. Oh my gosh, what are they going to say today? Um, interestingly enough, there is the expectation that inflation will actually tick up today. So, in other words, the overall annual rate of inflation will tick up. Uh, this has to do with really a couple of things that are going on. First of all, energy prices obviously rising recently, but more so than that, it's just these year over year comparisons. And again, we've talked about the math before. So again, as, as oil prices have ticked up here, uh, we've seen some increases in prices elsewhere in the economy as we've had a little bit of economic pickup here as of late. So again, expectations are for a slight rise in CPI today. Now this will be not enough to well, theoretically, it won't be enough to spook the Fed into hiking rates more, um, you know, particularly uh, with Jackson Hole Summit coming up. But, you know, again, there's always that potential for a shocker. And a, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, this morning. But uh, again, you know, we go back to this kind of analysis, a much weaker than expected CPI report this morning obviously be uh, will help boost asset prices higher. Now, stocks sold off again yesterday. We'll talk about this in a minute, but Again, we're still kind of in that correction phase here at the moment. Nothing really concerning. Um, a very hot CPI number obviously coming in today would certainly put pressure downward on stock prices this morning. Again, expectations are that if inflation ticks up a lot harder than expected, maybe the Fed has to remain higher for longer. The hope by the markets ever since the beginning of, of really since October has been, you know, the Fed cutting rates and getting, you know, bringing back more monetary accommodation. Uh, that's been the hope. And, and again, so far, the Fed has not been accommodated to that yet, but there's always the hope, right? We have to have faith that this will eventually happen. And that's really what's been helping support the markets here. But again, this inflation number is going to be important this morning. Um, one thing, though, is, is, and we've talked about this before, is housing. Housing makes up uh, about 40% of the entire CPI index, and that's the homeowner's equivalent rent. And this is a calculation that basically just works out to the fact that um, Brent owns a home, right? And so he has his house and he says, okay, so the survey says, well, if you could rent your house, what would you rent it for, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the premise. And this is how we come up with homeowners equivalent rent. It's basically what homeowners would charge to rent their house. And then we use that as the inflation adjustment for home ownership. And you know, what that, you know, what is causing either the rise or fall in, in prices. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of sentiment based analysis, but the idea is that, is that when you have inflationary periods, then homeowners would require higher rents for their homes. And that's a big chunk of the CPI index. So the problem with that, though, is that lags about three to four months before it shows up. So housing prices have been coming down. We have been seeing that. Homer's equivalent rent is coming down, but there's this lag that's still got to catch up. So there's still going to be more downward pressure on CPI over the course of the next 12 months or so as this kind of lag effect of homeowners equivalent rent continues to kind of feed into uh, the CPI index again is because it's such just it's just such a large proportion of that index, and you know, the, the, and when you talk about energy, it's it's a very small component. It's about three to four percent. So you know, we take a look at energy as a function of CPI. It's not that big of a contributor. So movements in energy don't hit really hard in terms of like that homeowner's equivalent rent does. But again, this is the why the Fed also strips out food and energy because of volatility from month to month. They strip that out, they look at that core. And so the thing to really kind of look at, if you really kind of want to know where the Fed is looking, is look at the core CPI today, core PCE tomorrow. So tomorrow we have the, uh, the um, Personal Consumption Expenditures Index for inflation. So this is the inflation consumers are paying when they're buying stuff. So uh, core, core CPI today, core PCE tomorrow, that'll give you a pretty good indication 
of where the Fed is likely to move to next. Now, again, the, the big thing for the Fed is coming up is the Jackson Hole Summit meeting. This is that economic composing, uh, symposium they have every year. The, likely what the Fed will say there is that they are still being data-driven, data-focused on what's happening with inflation. But I think they're going to start to hint towards being done hiking rates, but leading towards this thing of, of, hey, we're done hiking rates, but we're not cutting anytime soon. And I think that's the message we're going to start to see here in the next month or so, particularly from the Fed. Okay. Here's what you need to know before the bell this morning. Uh, markets did sell off a bit more yesterday. Again, we just kind of keep going through this correctional phase in the markets right now. So again, nothing here uh, to be concerned about to any great degree. Something we've been talking about for the last couple, you know, last month or so, saying, hey, markets are very overbought. We're due to a 3 to 5% correction. It was kind of ad nauseum. Um, well, we've had 3% in the correction so far, so we're working in that process still above the 50-day moving average, which still right now seems to be like the most likely support level for the markets. Markets are starting to get a little bit of oversold here. Uh, markets are going to try to bounce again this morning. We've tried a couple of bounces uh, you know, during this kind of correctional phase that have failed. So again, we're going to try to bounce again this morning. We'll see if we can hold that through the day. A lot of this will hinge on the CPI report this morning. But again, we're kind of oversold enough really short term uh, for a bounce here in the market. So again, kind of expect that today. The other side of this, though, as we've been talking about for a while, is bonds. And uh, again, over the next 18 to 24 months, this is still likely going to be your very best opportunity for investment. And in fact, just a couple of days ago, I doubled in my personal investment account and doubled my own bond position uh, for this reason is that if you, this is a, a kind of a longer term monthly chart of interest rates going back to 1994. And again, we're moving up and we have been really kind of fighting here with a double top in interest rates. And we're very close to, to triggering a monthly sell signal on interest rates, which is at the highest level since 1994. And, I had, and you have to go way back to the 70s to find a level higher than this. But uh, again, markets, you know, the bond market interest rates themselves are extremely overbought here, about to trigger a sell signal. Uh, that is like, and again, this is a monthly index, so this moves slowly, right? This takes a month of data to change. So again, doesn't mean that interest rates are going to go plummeting tomorrow, but we are certainly in the position here, and this kind of goes back to that Federal Reserve conversation. If they start talking about staying here, keeping the rates higher for longer, economic weakness is going to start setting in because of higher rates. That's going to start to pull yields down here. So again, you know, when you start to look at stocks versus bonds in terms of valuation, bonds are extremely undervalued when stocks are extremely overvalued. That tends to work out in the favor of bond owners longer term. So again, kind of, you know, just when you start thinking about markets and, and where to put capital, this is kind of one of those math functions that, that work in the markets and, and again, tend to play out. But again, on a short term basis, stocks are certainly ruling the roost right now because that so stocks are very much sentiment driven. And again, the chase right now for you know, speculation in the markets for gambling in the markets, that's certainly here and present. Again, so you know, as we have this correction in the stock market, there's going to be here another push in stock prices moving into the end of the year. Certainly don't discount that just simply because of sentiment and, and kind of this risk on attitude. That's what you need to know before the bell this morning. When we come back from the break, I want to pick up on a couple of other interesting things. The jolts, uh, you know, we keep having these employment numbers come out stronger than expected. And particularly talking about the jolts numbers. And uh, there's kind of an interesting dichotomy that's happening. We'll talk about that when we come back from the break right here on The Real Investment Show. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. 
The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So welcome back to the show this morning. So kind of just an, you know, just kind of an interesting point, right? Every month we've had these uh, kind of these very strong employment numbers that keep coming out. Uh, unemployment rate remains low. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why theoretically we haven't had a recession yet, because uh, when the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at the economic data employment's one of those factors and we've never had a, a, a pickup in the unemployment rate to suggest that the economy is actually slowing down so we keep having these really you know fairly strong employment numbers and then you take a look at the jolts survey now so the jolts survey is the job opening labor turnover survey so it just basically looks at how many jobs are available versus people looking for jobs, right? So right now, that's like 1.6 jobs open for every worker. So that means that if you want a job, there's a job for you, and then there's an extra you know, job there for somebody that's 0.6. So short people have a really good shot at a job right now. Brent. Um, <laughs> 0.6 worker. Yeah. Just, okay, just explaining. Anyway. <laughs> I think I just got marginalized. <laughs> just a bit. So the, the point here, though, is you have so 1.6 jobs available. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. I, I want to read to you the survey that came out. Uh, this was among the key revelations in a Deloitte survey, right? The big accounting firm. Overall, survey results indicate that financial services institutions with overly strict in-office mandates – could face challenges, possibly losing their pipeline of leaders and having difficulty recruiting talent. Among respondents who still work remotely, at least part-time, 66% of those say that they would likely leave their current role if mandated to return to the office five days a week. Now, this is kind of interesting. So we have this exceptionally strong employment number, right? Um, we have this exceptionally low unemployment rate. But then yet we have, for every worker, there's an extra 0.6 of a job opening, right? So some of this just doesn't really kind of jive in terms of the data. And we've talked about this disparity before. So, so again, if, if, I'm, if I'm a worker right now, what I feel like, right, I feel like that if you're going to force me to come back to work, I'll just quit my job and go find another job. But as more companies start to now mandate in, in work or in office work, it may not be as easy to quit a job and then to move to another job. But this goes back to that very low unemployment rate. If we have an extremely low unemployment rate, 
then what jobs are there actually available, right? And this is what I'm saying. So, so again, it's just you know some of this data that we get. And again, there's so many things that go on with the data in terms of manipulations, et cetera, in terms of you know the birth death adjustment and you know seasonality adjustments and all these type of things that are very subject to human error because of the way the calculations are done. You know, you have to start to question, do we really have a 3.8% unemployment rate in the economy? Now, now, what does that mean, by the way, right? 3.8% unemployment rate. What that effectively means is if you take a look at the labor force, and those are people that we count as part of the labor force, that means that basically 96.2%, if you have a 3.8% unemployment rate, 96.2% of people are, are working. So there's only a few jobs out there to be filled before you have 100% employment, correct? But yet we have this 1.6, you know, job openings per worker. So if there's 1.6 job openings per worker, that means there's a lot of empty vacancies outside of the labor force. So why isn't why don't we have 100 percent employment? Why why isn't the unemployment rate zero? Because if you have 1.6 job openings, that means that there's more job openings than there are workers available. So why not have zero unemployment in terms of the labor force? These are. These are hypothetical questions, by the way. I'm not expecting an answer from anybody. <laughs> but again, I think we have to start to really think about, you know, the validity of some of this data relative to what's actually happening in the economy. We also have to kind of look at the fact of how we calculate the labor force. Who do we count as employed? Who do we count as unemployed? Who do we not count as all? at all, right? So if you're working three part-time jobs and been doing that for a while, we don't count you as part of the labor force, but you're working your ass off, right? So that doesn't even make sense. So it's really hard to get a gauge on really just how strong the labor force market is or, or just how strong the employment market is. But, you know, right now, workers do have a choice. Okay, you want to force me to come back to work. I don't want to. I can go find another job. There will be a point to where that will no longer be an option. When the economy does slow down, when when you know you see broad sectors, you know we you know, you know we've seen layoffs in companies recently, uh, you know, particularly in the tech sector because they overhired during the whole you know pandemic shutdown you know we geared up all this technology you know work from you know for for work from home right so we had zoom and all these other online tech firms that popped up peloton and so there's a lot of hiring and employment there and companies like google and amazon and others because everybody's working from home we had to ramp up shipments and all those type of things so there was a lot of increase in hiring in these tech firms that wasn't sustainable because the activity was created artificially by those stimulus checks to households. So as soon as the, that money kind of ran out, those jobs had to get lost. So yeah, we saw a lot of layoffs there. And you know, I've, I've talked about this before is that those layoffs weren't really that big of a concern because they were kind of very centered in the technology space. However, at some point, as we do head towards the next recession, whenever that occurs, 2024, 2025, whenever it is, then we will see probably a broader swath of layoffs and that that job opening per worker will drop and the option to work from home or not work from home may evaporate now again look a lot of companies have adopted this as just part of their culture now they're like saying okay you work three days a week you get two days a week at home you know figure it out so there, you know, the work. I'm not saying the work from home is ever going away, right? It's it is definitely here to stay, but to work entirely remotely, and you know, if if you are one of these individuals that go, I only want to work remote. I only want to work from home. I never want to go to the office. That may not be an option in the future, and the company may say, Hey, we're requiring you to come in at least three days a week. And you go, well, I'll just quit and get another job that allows me to work from home. That, that may not be available is the point. 
And one reason, and we've talked about this before, one reason that that may not be an availability at some point here in the near future is because of commercial real estate. You got to remember, a lot of these companies spend a lot of money on commercial real estate. Their offices, et cetera, they're paying for that. And if they're paying for it, they're going to say, hey, we, we need to be using it. Y'all need to come back to work and use the office that we're paying for. And that may be, become more of a requirement. We'll see. But I just think, again, I, you know, when we take a look, the, the point here is this. Is that, you know, when you take a look at the employment data in particular, I think you have to, you know, analyze it with, you know, a, a, just kind of a, a bit of clarity because, again, just, you know, as we report these numbers, we go, oh, we created 189,000 jobs this month. But yet the unemployment rate rose or whatever, right? You, you got to kind of balance these things out because some of this stuff, does, these numbers right now, they don't really jive with each other. They used to have, there, there used to be a much better correlation between job openings and, and employment data. But that's definitely been skewed ever since the, the pandemic shutdown. And that, and that really goes for a lot of the economic data. When you take a look at a lot of this economic data, this, this is also just an important thing to remember, is that the pandemic shutdown, when we shut down the economy, we really screwed up a lot of the historical data trends, GDP, employment, inflation, a lot of this, because of, of the impact of literally shutting down the economy and saying, you can't go to work, you have to stay home. So some of this is just going to take time. Uh, again, you know, we, we hear these numbers, you know, uh, President Biden has created more jobs than any other president in history. Not really, no. You can't count laying off a bunch of workers and then putting those same workers back into their same jobs again when we open the economy back up is creating a new job. That's not creating new, new jobs. We have a growing population. So every month we need to be creating at least 200,000 jobs just to be keeping up with the growth of the population. We got, we got, as we have new entrants into the workforce, we have to employ those individuals. So not only do we have to keep the workers working that we have, we need to be creating literally 200,000 new jobs a month or whatever the number is just to keep up with population growth over time. So if I take 200,000 people and I lay them off work and then I bring them back to work, I didn't create new jobs. I just put them back to work because I not only need those 200,000 workers, but I now need those 200,000 workers to fill the jobs that I shut down. Plus, I need to put new workers that came into the labor force to work, right? So this is going to take, the point here is that all that anomaly that we created during the shutdown is going to take time to work through the data until we get back to some normalcy trends. But I think you have to just kind of keep a watch on the data for now. Anyway, just, just some random thoughts this morning. Michael Leibowitz is out today because of his son. He'll be back next week. Um, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about markets and money. Don't go away. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell reports, Candid Coffee, and Lunch and Learn replays, plus each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show show or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com realinvestmentadvice.com health and financial security touches everyone within your organization offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated hi i'm tom allen senior benefits consultant at ria advisors ria benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business the culture you want to establish and the budget you are able to work within book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com retirement and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset your people realinvestmentadvice.com retirement realinvestmentadvice.com you're listening to the real investment show 
In 1999, a paraphiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. So last night I, I wasn't sleeping well, so I got up and went into the uh, living room, just kind of laid down on the couch for a little bit. And she she always leaves a light on in the front of the house. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. This morning my wife is up. She's like, honey, did you know that the lamp was off in the living room? Why is it off? Did somebody break in? I said, yes, honey, a climate activist broke in last night, turned our lamp off. <laughs> at realinvestmentadvice.com. Calm. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281 501 1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell reports, plus each day's radio shows. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Morning. You know, so Michael Leibowitz, uh, as I said, he's out this morning. He's uh, taking care of his son. But, you know, he resides in uh, Maryland, up north, over there. You know where I'm talking about. You can see the Capitol from his front window, pretty much. Um, thought it was interesting this morning, a story out, because we actually talked about this um, when this occurred. I guess, what was this, back in 2020? Um, but back when the Washington Redskins um, were being cancel cultured, right? And they were being accused of a pro, you know, cultural appropriation and all this other stuff by, by the, the social warrior justice people, right? And so there was this big pressure on the Washington Redskins to change their name. And so they acquiesced. And they did. And we had a conversation about this at the time. And, you know, they were they had put out a public call for a new name and and all this other stuff. And so but to, to not offend the Indians and the Native Americans, they changed their names, you know, to get rid of this whole history of of, you know, what happened with the Indians. They changed their name to the Washington Commanders. And, of course, at the time, there was this big push on the Washington Redskins, the Florida, the Florida Seminoles, by the way, which, by the way, Florida Seminoles never changed their name. And it all came down to a lot of money. They had a big donor that came in and said, you do not change the name. There's a whole history and culture in Florida around the Seminoles. You're not changing the name. And so they never changed their name. It always comes down to money, by the way. <laughs> so but anyway, so the Washington Redskins changed their name to the Washington Commanders which was a terrible name. <laughs> that's the best you could come up with. You put out a public survey, and that's the best you could come up with. But, you know, I really can't say much, you know, about that, being here from Houston. Remember, we had the Houston Oilers, right? Yeah. Right? And then we put out a whole name, you know, we had to put out a whole thing out there for everybody to publicly comment on a new name 
for the football team after the Oilers left, right? The Oilers w- went to Tennessee, became the Titans. So we put out a whole thing, and there were some great names that were in there. Gunslingers, a whole bunch of stuff, right? I mean, there's some really great names for a Houston, Texas football team. Best we can come up with, the Texans. Really. Results by committee. Yeah. The Texans. That's what we came up with. Anyway, I don't know who drives these things, but there you go. So thought it was interesting. Uh, this actually came out this week. A change.org petition has been launched. And it's been launched by the a group called the Native American Guardians Association. And they are petitioning to have the name of the Washington Commanders changed back to the Washington Redskins. Yeah, there's a lot of support for this, by the way. There's yeah. a ton of support for this. Um, I'll just read to you from the article because it's, it's just kind of interesting. A change.org petition in support of changing the Washington football team's name back to the Redskins has gone viral and is racking up tens of thousands of signatures in real time. At the time of publication, the petition was nearing nearly 75,000 people so far. The petition was launched by an organization called the Native American Guardians Association, whose stated goal is to end the cancel culture of Native Americans. Stop canceling us <laughs> is their basic understanding, right? You know, the you know, getting rid of the, you know, the 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 in, the Cleveland Indians, the Washington Redskins, the Florida Seminoles. They're saying that, "Hey, you're getting rid of our you're canceling our culture." I know you think you're trying to protect us, but you're getting rid of all of our legacy of people, you know, knowing about Indians, right? So they're they're pushing for this and they're getting a lot of support for it. So I think it's great, um, you know, to see that because, again, you know, everybody liked the Washington Redskins anyway. So it, it was just a – it wasn't a real favorite thing. But the big problem is going to come, of course. <laughs> the real problem <laughs> is yet to come for the football team. You got to get all the uniforms. You got to get your oh, helmets yeah, back. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get business cards changed. So they didn't like store those away. I guess not. <laughs> kind of bring them out and dust them off a bit. I'm I sure love the irony. The yeah. cancel culture gets canceled. Yeah, ah, I think it's great. But we'll we'll see we'll we'll see how how well the position because again this really comes down to the football team, right? Is yeah. the, the will the football team? say okay great we'll change our name back after they just change it i doubt they will right we'll see i doubt they will because again they just, you got to think about the naming of the stadium you know all of that and again this is and again this is a money thing right mm-hmm. this, so at the end of the day this is all about money because the reason the florida seminoles never changed and there was a big pu- there was a huge push just like on the the washington redskins there was a huge push on the florida seminoles to change their name because of their Indian reference, right? And they had a massive donor come in and said, you ain't changing it, right? Money talks. So at the end of the day, it'll be it'll be money that ultimately determines what happens. So, you know, if a big donor showed up and said, hey, if you change your name back to the Redskins, I'll buy the naming rights to the stadium for $5 million, whatever it is. Those, those naming rights are very expensive. $100 million, $5 million is really cheap. Uh, they're, some of them run $100 million or more. So it's it's all about money at the end of the day. So if the Washington Redskins change their name back, I'm sure there'll be some money involved somewhere. Do along you the way. and Michael have a bet on this going no, no. on? No. Just curious. No bet yet. No. Well, no, yeah, no bet yet. But <laughs> I, I, I know how you roll. Well, yeah, I'll roll. It'll be something like I have to wear a Washington Redskins hat or something for a month uh, on the show. I, I, something something bad will come out of this bet is all I'm saying. The name Commanders fails to capture the essence, tradition, and historical weight associated with the Redskins. It lacks a uniqueness, emotional connection, and pride that our team's original name embodies. The change to Commanders dilutes the team identity and weakens the connection with its devoted fan base. By restoring Redskins' name, we reinstate the symbol of unity, strength, and shared identity that has inspired generations of fans so that was a statement that was that was made so didn't the uh, the atlanta braves did they keep their name yeah i'm i'm in, in the cleveland indians yeah yeah so far so far <laughs> 
Redskins caved. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Now, anyway. Does this mean to bring back the tomahawk chalk? Uh, I hope so. That that would be that would be an important part of it. Appropriate. Because that that's again, this goes back to the Seminoles. Yeah. They still have a guy that rides rides out on the horse, throws a spear into He's the fifty great. throws the spear into the fifty yard marker, yeah. you know, the whole nine yards. So yeah, they still they keep that tradition going. So I guess if you bring the Redskins back, you bring tradition back with it as well. Yeah. So I'm gonna read to you a list of ingredients. Tell me what it is. Water, pea protein, isolate, expeller, press, canola oil. This sounds so yummy. Refined coconut oil, cellulose from bamboo, methyl cellulose, potato starch, natural flavor, maltodextrin, yeast extract, salt, sunflower oil, vegetable glycerin, dried yeast, uh, citrus extract, ascorbic acid, beef juice, beet juice extract, acetic acid, succinic acid, and modified food starch. So if you can tell me what that is, Brent will send you a candied coffee coffee cup. Yes, I will. So... If you go on our YouTube channel, uh, you got uh, 15 minutes to come up with the answer before the top of the show. If you can come up with the right answer, Britt will send you a candy coffee coffee cup, and I will tell you what the answer is at the end of the show. So don't give them any hints. No. Okay. Somebody wanted me to stand up and let them know what point six he, looked like. He is standing I up. I am standing up. <laughs> <laughs> It's Don't all, make fun of Brent. Do not make fun of Brent. It's all about cam, camera angles. Correct. <laughs> all right. Um, so this morning, again, um, you know, we're still finishing up earnings season right now as we kind of get through it. Today, we've got Alibaba came out this morning. Earnings were okay. Stock uh, is, is trying to trade up here a bit. Tapestry trading down about 4% this morning as well we also have ralph lauren uh yeti holdings which is the overpriced uh mugs like this one <laughs> you know they're great for keeping stuff warm they cost so i'll tell you a quick story i went into uh we we were going uh to the lake and um for a quick little trip this was summer before last and we we're just gonna run up to the lake for the weekend and our cooler broke at our house and the handle broke off of it and it was a mess. And we were trying to get, you know, ice chest put in the back of the, the thing. And we're running late. And, and so I just ran into Academy real quick. I was not paying attention. I grabbed this Yeti kind of cooler bag, right? And it was large enough to throw some drinks in. We could throw it, get it on the boat, et cetera. I wasn't paying any attention at all. Took it up to the counter. And it's a long line of people, right? I'm in a hurry. And so I get up to the counter and there's like 10 people behind me. There was like five people in front of me get up to the counter, drop this Yeti cooler on there. And I'm like, cool, man, I'm going to be in. I'm going to be out. We're going to be on the road. It's great. Wife, kids, everybody is in the car. He goes, that'll be $230. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, it's $230. I was like, it's a cooler. But at that point, I'm completely screwed. I've got to get going. People are behind me. I can't get out of line, get back in line, you know, find other things. So I wound up paying $230 for a Yeti cooler. So I did support their stock price, <laughs> but they report earnings today. But uh, this this crap is expensive. Works. By the way, I didn't buy this. This was a gift. Somebody, somebody gave it to me. Promo but, sample. No, it wasn't a promo sample. I don't know where, I, where it came from, actually. But it's nice. He's got coffee warm in the morning. Yeah. I wouldn't pay for it again. <laughs> Still trying to work out. That that cooler is going to be buried with. I'm going to be buried in that cooler. No coffin for me. Bury me in the Yeti cooler because it was more expensive than the coffin. Be right back. Investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Oh, Red, I declare I plum missed that candy coffee. Whatever am I gonna do? Don't you worry, little darling. We'll watch it again on our YouTube channel. Why, Red? 
never. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn, the special topic discussions, and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to the Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. And now another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So, just before the break, I asked the question. I read, actually, I read some ingredients water, pea protein, isolate, expeller press, canola oil, refined coconut oil, cellulose from bamboo, methacellulose, potato starch, natural flavor, maltodextrin, yeast extract, salt, sunflower oil, blah, 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 blah. And asked what it was. And this is basically a substitute. And I said, if you can identify this, we'll send you a candy coffee coffee mug. And we have a winner, Dan. I just had a tie. I, I just double checked. We have we have a tie. Okay, Dan so, and Erica M. So Erica M. and Dan will will send you each a coffee mug. Uh, so if you will email me your mailing address, um, email Brent at riaadvisors.com. So that's Brent B E R N T at riaadvisors two A's in the middle dot com and uh, just send me your mailing address and we'll send you out a coffee mug. It is a substitute for something that has. Literally one ingredient. <laughs> Beef. Yeah. So, yeah, those are the ingredients for a Beyond Meat burger. And uh, just interesting. So you have to have all of those ingredients to replace beef. <laughs> it's what's for dinner. <laughs> it's what's for dinner. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> just, just. You know, this is one of those things like in 20 years, they figure if you've been eating Beyond Meat for the last 20 years, you've developed cancer. Congratulations. And call these attorneys. <laughs> and call these attorneys. <laughs> That's the way that stuff always works out, right? <laughs> yeah, they've got a new they've got a new one out today, right? Oh? If you drink one Coke a day, well, I say Coke, right? But soda. Apparently drinking one soda a day will lead to liver cancer, according to new studies. Now, that doesn't really surprise me, considering that you can use Coke to basically knock the rust off <laughs> of a frozen bolt, but <laughs> one Coke a day. But again, tell that to Warren Buffett, who drinks literally, I think he drinks like a liter of Diet Coke a day. Well, he's pre-embalmed. Well, correct. But, you know, he doesn't have liver cancer and he's still kicking on. So, you know, this is like, I had an uncle, right? Smoked like probably 10. I never saw the man without a cigar in his mouth, right? And I mean, always smoking a cigar or chewing on one, either one of the two. And I probably had to smoke, I, I you know, not no exaggeration. He probably smoked six to eight cigars a day, probably. And, you know, never had cancer, never, you know, and people say, well, you know, you smoke, you're going to get cancer. And he's like, bah! Humbug. <laughs> he lived to be like 48. I mean, not. 
No, he he lived like he was like 88, 89 when he passed away. He, he lived a fairly, fairly, fairly good life. You know, the guy that invented the treadmill died at 54. Just saying. On a treadmill. <laughs> On a treadmill. So, you know, it's always interesting. There's this, like they were interviewing uh, a while back. There was a, a guy who's like 106, and he was on one of the uh, late night talk shows. Uh, not Johnny Carson, but one, one of the. Steve Allen? No, it wasn't. I mean, it was one of the post Johnny Carson oh, okay. hosts, right? Yeah. yeah, Letterman or somebody. Somebody, yeah. Anyway, he's like 106 years old. And he goes, What's your secret to you know, living so long? He goes, Shot of whiskey every day. Kills all the bad stuff. Uh, apparently. So, <laughs> you know, they say all this stuff causes cancer, right? But it's like, oh, if you do this, you're going to develop cancer. Pretty much anything you do, you're going to develop cancer and die. That's, I'm just convinced of this now. It's like, you know, if, if too much sweetener, you're going to die of cancer. You know, drink a Coke a day, you're going to die of cancer. Look, you're all going to die. You're going to die. That's just all there is to it. Might as well enjoy it. I mean, you, look, you got to take care of yourself. You got to eat right. You got to do those things right. You don't want to be miserable while you're living, but you've also got to live a little along the way and not not worry about every little thing that's going to cause cancer. But I think you can do a good job of just eating beef. <laughs> Maybe not put so many chemicals into your system at one time. Maybe just, you know, eat beef. Um, anyway. A uh, couple other things uh, going, like I said, uh, kind of going on this morning. Uh, we were talking about earnings uh, before the break. Alibaba, Ralph Lauren, Yeti Holdings out today. Um, Wolverine World Ride, Krispy Kreme Donuts. Krispy Kreme Donuts. Um, Six Flags, Haynes Brands, Dillard's, Flower Foods, Flowers Foods, sorry, uh, and News Corp. All reporting earnings today. Economic data, of course, is the consumer price index. All eyes on that this morning. That's expected to be 3.3% this morning, um, up from 3% last month. So again, that kind of that small increase. CPI uh, month over month is expected to be up 0.2% versus 2% previously. And, and that's now now we're back into, by the way, that 2.2%. That is the standard run rate of inflation. That is, that is basically when you ask an economist, what do you think inflation will be? The out of the box answer is always 0.2%. Not 0.1, not 0.3, not zero. It's 0.2. That is the standard expectation. What's it going to be? 0.2. Why? Because that's been the long term run rate, right? So they just go, well, it's always been 0.2. It's going to be 0.2. So that's just the, that's just the base expectation of what inflation is going to be. What's 0.2 times 12? That's 2.4% inflation. That's the long-term run rate of inflation. That's how you get there. So again, expected right off the cuff, B.2 CPI for the core, year-over-year 4.8% expected. Uh, that was the same as it was last month. So no change to core. Up, guess what? 0.2. Versus previously. So it's expected to be 0.2. Again, that's just the standard long term run rate. Uh, jobless claims also come out today as well. Um, you know, so we'll see that. Disney um, also announced earnings yesterday. And, you know, Bob Iger has taken back over as CEO and is struggling to try to figure out how to get the stock price off of dec decade lows. And, Bob, I can help you out with that if you need some help. Uh, it's not difficult to get your company turned around, but you might want to start going back to doing what you did before um, when you were making good money. But, <laughs> but overall, um, streaming uh, subs came in weaker than expected. That was kind of weighing on the stock price initially, but they are now changing the pricing for been a pretty radical pricing shift, uh, increasing the cost of the Disney streaming service. Uh, so that's giving the um, stock a little bit of a boost this morning. But again, uh, Disney's been under a lot of pressure from just a, a whole string of, of bad decisions, uh, both politically as well as as um, entertainment-wise. Movies they've been making have been have just been repeated flops. Um, they're on track to lose more than a billion dollars right now in, in recent movie productions that they've made. So, again, they, they have definitely have a turnaround situation that they need to get under control. But also part of it is, is the economy. I mean, it's expensive, right, to go to Disney. If you, I mean, 
when your when your business is theme park business, that's a big chunk of your business. Um, it's expensive to go to Disney. It's not cheap, and it's pricing more and more people right now because of where we are economically out of the ability to go. So it's not surprising to see revenue growth has slowed at their theme park industry, but you're also seeing that same type of sluggishness, again, in subscriber business, in their new service, ESPN, et cetera, all under pressure um, as of late. So again, you know, uh, Disney's, you know, kind of trading flattish a little bit up this morning after their earnings announcement, but again, trailing well behind their counterpart, Netflix, um, in terms of the movie distribution side. So, again, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, outside of that, tomorrow, of course, uh, we get PCE. Now, again, as we talked about earlier in the show today, that you know personal consumption's expenditure index, that's expected to also be up 0.7. So, again, you know, personal consumption expenditure inflation has been a little bit hotter than, than CPI. Again, none of this um, really is going to be a, a, a mover for the Federal Reserve. A, A, the Federal Reserve already knew all this, but um, there's also several Fed speakers later on this afternoon. So I think that we're probably going to get some, you know, kind of hints of kind of what the next moves for the Fed are going to be. I think you're going to hear a lot more talk about, be, you know, being data dependent, just kind of analyzing the month to month data as it comes in, making um, <clears throat> decisions on monetary policy based on the incoming data being data dependent. I think you hear a lot of talk about that from the Fed uh, this afternoon when you hear these speeches. And I think you still hear them be somewhat concerned over this idea that, you know, inflation is still high, um, higher than they would like it to be, and that they're going to remain vigilant on that front and kind of, you know, putting these hints out there about higher for longer, maybe not without saying that directly, but, you know, keeping these hints out that, they're not really in the mood or the position to start cutting rates anytime soon. And remember, the market is still right now pricing for end of the year rate cuts. And, I, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, could disappoint the markets. And again, you know, this, there's been this real dichotomy between the market and, you know, recession ideas. And, you know, this this idea that the Fed is going to be cutting rates sooner than later, that could disappoint the markets a bit. We'll see. Um, and, and again, it wouldn't be surprising to see this market, you know, kind of slow its advance from the beginning of this year into the end of this year. In other words, kind of a more sloppy, choppy sideways to slightly higher market by year end would not be surprising at all as the realization of inflation and slower economic growth kind of comes home to roost. Anyway, that wraps up the show for the day. Um, Danny Ratliff, Richard Russo here tomorrow. And, of course, uh, this weekend's newsletter is coming out. We're talking about technical review of the markets. Why now is probably a good time to look at bonds for the next 18 to 24 months. All coming up in our newsletter this weekend. Make sure you're subscribed to the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. See you back here tomorrow.